I'm Richard Levin, President and CEO of the Arnold P. Gold Foundation, and I welcome all of you here to this special Voices presentation of the Vilcek Gold Award. Uh, it's perfect that we are meeting immediately after that extraordinary opening session uh, with uh, that wonderful presentation, the music uh, focused on the importance of humanism in all things that we do as a means of providing some social order, conscience to the moment, even joy, uh, as mentioned, from the podium and certainly love. This uh, special Voices of Medicine and Society lecture will be given by Dr. Mona Fuad. It's entitled, It's All About the People, Compassion and Resilience in the Journey Toward Health Equity. The Voices of Medicine and Society series of the AAMC spotlights innovative scholars and fresh thinkers throughout the field. This lecture, and the award associated with it, emphasizes the profound impact of immigrants on American healthcare. Although immigrants represent only 17% of the US workers overall, 28% of all practicing physicians are immigrants, and 38% of home health aides are immigrants, the AAMC has been an unbelievably strong advocate for pathways for immigrants to pursue medical careers in America. And AAMC trustee, Dr. Joan Reed, faculty member and dean at Harvard, had planned to be here and tell us about this history. But unanticipated events prevent her from joining us. And so I'll just share a few words about the AAMC as partner in this venture. As I said, they've been wonderful uh, partner for a long time in recognizing exemplars of humanism. As AAMC president and CEO, Dr. David Scorton has said previously in introducing this award, the United States and our healthcare system in particular benefits enormously from the talents and skills of immigrant professionals. It's been critically important that the Vilcek Gold Award for Humanism and Healthcare has in fact had these three dedicated partners. And the AAMC originally through President Emeritus, Dr. Daryl Kirsch, who couldn't be here today, gave the Vilcek Gold Award a permanent home at this meeting. As most of you know, the Gold Foundation was founded in 1988 to foster humanism in healthcare and to anchor a focus on the dignity of all people and their right to compassion and respect in every health encounter. To share a few words from our wonderful partner, the Vilcek Foundation, please welcome Program Officer Julia Lowe, my friend who will then officiate in a brief ceremony and later make closing remarks at the conclusion of the Q&A, which will uh, follow the lecture today. Julia. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Rich. And we are very thankful for our partnership with the Arnold P. Gold Foundation and with, of course, the AAMC. The Vilcek Foundation was founded by Dr. Jan Vilcek and his wife, Maritza Vilcek, to celebrate immigrant contributions to the US. This mission was inspired by their experiences. Jan and Maritza had defected from the former Czechoslovakia as refugees. Immigrating allowed them to pursue their careers freely in biomedical research and in art history, respectively. Jan had joined the faculty at NYU School of Medicine, and there his research on interferon and later TNF, tumor necrosis factor, led to the development of Remicade, the anti-inflammatory drug. 
It was the first of its kind in a new class of medical treatments for a variety of autoimmune disorders. Prompted by their successes, Jan and Maritza established the Vilcic Foundation to spotlight other immigrants' contributions to the United States and showcase the value of immigration to this country. Since 2000, the foundation has awarded more than seven million in prizes and nearly six million in grants towards our mission, raising awareness of immigrant contributions to the United States and fostering appreciation for the arts and the sciences. Our Vilcha Gold Award honors the missions of both the Gold and Vilcha Foundations. It's the first Vilcha Award to specifically honor healthcare and it's the first gold award to specifically recognize immigrants. Past recipients of the award have included the whistleblower of the Flint water crisis, Dr. Mona Hanna Tisha, our current U.S. Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murthy, and the founders of Pre-Health Dreamers, Drs. Nu Latavangskorn and Denise Rojas Marquez. And today, we couldn't be happier to be celebrating and honoring Dr. Mona Fuad. Thanks, Julia. And now let me tell you something about the honoree, and then we'll present her with the 2022 award. Dr. Mona Fuad is a leader in groundbreaking health disparities research, whose entire career has been devoted to equity in healthcare. Dr. Fuad was born in Cairo, Egypt, and she was an uncommon soul who, as a woman, successfully attended medical school at Alexandria University in Egypt when her family was encouraging her to pursue music as a career. She's a very talented musician. And she decided of course, to become a doctor. In 1980, she and her husband moved to the United States, first settling in College Station, Texas, and then moving to Birmingham, Alabama. In both Egypt and in Alabama, Dr. Fuad saw how deeply socioeconomic status, race, and ethnicity were tied to healthcare access and outcomes. She independently, therefore, discovered the socioeconomic determinants of health. In 2002, 20 years ago, well before DEI was known and embraced, she founded the Minority Health and Health Equity Research Center at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, of which she remains the director. She is also Senior Associate Dean for Diversity and Inclusion in the UAB Piercing School of Medicine and Professor and Director of the UAB Division of Preventive Medicine. She's a beloved professor and incredible leader of both compassionate clinical care and pioneering research that has led to change. For her unique contributions, she was elected a member of the National Academy of Medicine in 2017. Dr. Fuad's impact is quite remarkable. And in her lecture, she's going to share with us her illuminating personal story, a journey that covers multiple continents and countries and extraordinary contributions to humanism in healthcare. On behalf of the Gold and Vilcek Foundations, please join Julia Lowe and me in welcoming to the stage the 2022 Vilcek Gold Honoree, Dr. Mona Fuad.
Thank you for being here today. Uh, I'm really honored to be giving this lecture today. So let me first begin with a heartful thanks to my UAB leaders and to my interim dean um, of the Hearsing School of Medicine, Dr. Anupam Agarwal. He's been a great support to my career and also he's the one who nominated me to this award. I also would like to thank the members of the Belchik Gold Committee. I am deeply honored and humbled to be standing here with you today. So I'm hoping that um, my talk today will inspire everybody that left their country and came here to the United States to make a career of their own. Also anyone from a diverse background that is also in their career journey. So as you mentioned, I was almost a concert pianist. I came very close to never being on the right continent to stand here with you today. For most of my life, science has been my driving force, my passion and my livelihood. So for those who know me, it may be difficult to imagine me in any other role. But from my early childhood, I was trained in classical piano, and that was where I dedicated my energy. So every com musical composer who has ever lived has had the same notes to work with, and from these notes are born almost infinite variations of sound. Madeleine Langel, the author of Winkle in Time, noted that it is the task of the artist to create cosmos out of chaos, or a symphony out of a bunch of notes. Also, the task of the scientist is very similar, to look at wealth of data and find patterns to see the chaos and, you know, and find the cosmos. I'm here with you today instead of playing piano in Poland, Egypt, or Italy, because the refrain of my life joined with melodies and harmonies of other remarkable people to create a cosmos I could not have imagined. I'm sure that I am not the only one to feel like my early years just passed quickly like a flurry of musical notes played at a rapid pace. I grew up in Alexandria, Egypt, the jewel of the Mediterranean. My parents raised me and my brother to value education, and I dedicated myself to my studies. In Egypt, your future is determined at the final year of what in the United States would be referred to a high school. Like the course of your life essentially is determined at the age of 16. Every student taking a comprehensive national examination, unlike the ACT or SAT, however, the test can only be taken once. That was at my time. And it decides your profession. A high score on the test means that you can choose the, the career of your choice, going to medical school or engineering school. A lower score limits you to a narrower range of career options. So. I was lucky I earned the high score on the test, which meant that I could go to medical school. This was the first change in the melody of my life. I did not have the time to dedicate myself both to music or to medicine. So I had to choose and put aside one of the choices. Although my piano teacher encouraged me to choose music, she told me medicine is not for women. Just learn music, languages, and the, the whole world will open for you. She was insistent. I decided on a medical career and pursued my studies at Alexandria University Faculty of Medicine. In my final year of training as a physician, I was exposed to what I would later understand were the social determinants of health. As part of my training, I was assigned to work in a rural area outside the city of Alexandria. The people in this town were not able to pay for medical care. 
and they suffered from chronic illnesses to an extent I had never seen before. Patients died before they get their turn to be seen at a free university hospital. I saw the situation that men and women were in and wondered, even if they could afford to see a doctor, how would they get there? Who would watch their children or their jobs? I believe that most people become health providers because they wanna help other people. And this encounter stayed with me. Shortly after I finished medical school, my husband and I moved to the United States, as you heard, so that he could complete his doctorate work at Texas A&M. After this, he took a position of what we thought would be only one year at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. I didn't know at the time that the melody of my life had changed permanently. But it was in moving from the Jewel of Mediterranean to the magic city Birmingham that my one simple tune became layered with the riches of the instruments and became much more a melody. I wonder if sometimes composers are surprised at the direction of their second movement of a symphony. I wonder if a conductor is ever surprised at her own interpretation of a piece of music. Caught in the flow of the moment, perhaps they are captured by a tide that feels not entirely of their own making. My husband had a job at the UB School of Engineering and I was determined to make a path for myself as well. I was admitted into the master's program in public health and after the completion of my studies, I worked as a volunteer and turned for six months at the Division of Preventive Medicine at the School of Medicine. But at last, I was hired for a, a paid position as a fellow. Around this time, national research was beginning to demonstrate the same thing that researchers at UAB were finding, that health outcomes were different for different groups of people. Out so some demographics were more likely to develop chronic or acute diseases and were less likely to survive them. This field of health disparities research and I found one another. Together, the researchers I was working for and I discovered that Birmingham City sanitation workers suffered disproportionately from high blood pressure. I wanted to be able to provide meaningful education to these workers, to be able to provide um, them with um, a control of their blood pressure. But immediately I ran into barriers. Our classes were scheduled in the downtown Birmingham Public Library, but nobody showed up. Finally, one of the supervisors told me that exhausted workers were coming off a long shift that started at four o'clock in the morning and were reluctant to leave their work site for the library. We began holding classes in the break rooms in their workplace instead. Although it was cramped and had little ventilation, by, take, by talking with the city employee, we came to understanding of what educational tools worked and which ones didn't. Visual aids with simple messages helped increase the impact of my messages. Sanitation workers began to take proactive measures to lower their blood pressure. So shortly after my arrival in the UEB Division of Preventive Medicine, I was introduced to uh, a colleague, Dr. Edward Partridge. It feels so unlikely that a woman physician from Alexandria, Egypt, and a surgeon from Demopolis in Alabama Black Belt rural areas would meet and form a lasting professional collaborations. Together, he and I began to research health disparities. Later, I was to begin collaborating with Dr. Selwyn Vickers, another surgeon from Demopolis, Alabama. The relationship would also prove pivotal to my career. 
it seems like there is an invisible line between Demopolis, Alabama and Alexandria in <laughs> Egypt that we didn't know about. It happened that Alabama was the perfect place to study health disparities. In fact, it served as a laboratory of sorts. Rates of cancer, heart disease, diabetes, and other chronic diseases are higher in the Deep South than elsewhere in the country. The work of my colleague and I were pursuing at UEB mirrored a national conversation taking place about the cause of health disparities, the social determinants of health, the interlocking factors of education, income, race, and ethnicity, family and cultural background, social status, and numerous other elements all combined to determine the health of individuals and their communities. It's easy to get trapped in the numbers, to miss the symphony of the notes. But our health disparities work has always been about the lives of real people. I remember after we started a patient navigator program, hearing a young woman speak in Montgomery, Alabama. This young mother had breast cancer and was part of our program. She said, what people don't understand is that if you have breast cancer and you are a single mom, you could end up being a homeless. This program saved me, not only provided me with treatment, but it helped me to keep my home, my job, and my family. One of the earliest challenges we faced was in enrolling minorities participants in clinical trial. According to the National Institute of Minority and Health Disparity, minorities account for fewer than 10% patients enrolled in clinical trials. This is a significant problem because clinical trials are absolutely essential to improving health of a number of reasons. Without minority participation, we could not achieve insights critical to treatment for all patients. However, there was high level of distrust toward medical providers among many underserved populations and for good reasons. Historically in the South, especially minorities have experienced harm at the hands of medical providers and we all remember the Tuskegee study. If we couldn't change the situation, health disparities would only deepen and increase. And it was at this point we experienced a key breakthrough, a pivot point. The, the critical factor we realized that we had to move at the speed of trust. Just as with the Birmingham City sanitation workers, we needed to meet people where they were and engage the community. This led to the creation of the UEB Recruitment and Retention Shared Facility. This facility focuses on building community relationships and to that end we train communities, uh, members, and to help us to reach participants and retain them. In the two decades since the establishment of this facility, we have enrolled more than 60,000 participants, mainly African Americans, for 125 research studies and the UEB adding priceless knowledge and insight to minority health. So trust wasn't just a key factor for enrollment of patients for clinical trials. It formed the cornerstone of all our health disparities work. One of our findings was that, especially in certain economically disadvantaged communities, African-American women were less likely to undergo breast and cervical cancer screenings. This meant that they were less likely to catch the cancer early enough to have a chance at a good health outcome. There were many reasons for this a part of distrust of the medical establishment. Many women had inadequate community and family support or lacked access to transportation you know, at the primary care physicians. 
During a trip to Mississippi Delta, I was struck by the depth of the poverty. It reminded me of my early days in rural Egypt, where I asked myself, even if they could afford to see a doctor, how would they get there? Who would watch their children? In addition to these questions, I thought, if we tell a woman from this area that she needs to get a mammogram with other health issues that she faces, what about diabetes, high blood pressures, or even paying her, her bills? We can't just tell her, go and get a mammogram and ignore everything else. To me, it was an unethical request. This led us to the establishment of what now is called the Minority Health and Health Equity Research Center. This center has three distinct pillars, research, community engagement, and career development training. Our research links, pillar links investigators of various disciplines and scientific background to conduct multidisciplinary health disparities research. Next, our community engagement team works with local organizations, build relationships and trust, and works with institutions and community leaders to establish partnership to support our research effort. But also we realized that the lack of minority and diverse researchers was contributing to the persistence of health disparities. So we developed a multi-tier trained program. These programs targeting undergraduates, graduate students, postdoctoral scholars, and junior faculty have impacted individuals throughout the country. They now provide minority representation in health professions and contribute critical research insights in our understanding of health disparities. In all, almost a thousand scholars have been trained by the various programs we develop and continue to offer. So any musician will tell you that timing is everything. Play the right notes at the wrong time, and instead of beauty, you get chaos. While my timing was very fortunate, it also required resilience. In the early 90s, when the science of health disparities was its in infancy, there were many people who had their doubts, both in me as an investigator and in the concept of health disparities research as a science. Many thought it was just community work. These are just few of the comments that I actually heard and they were told to me over the years. But even after hearing things, I persisted. The health disparities movement was played in parallel to a national one, which interacted with and, and complemented what was taking place at UAB. As we use grant funding to increase minority enrollment in clinical trial, establish community health advocates, and create patient navigators programs, the understanding of health disparities as key areas of research was growing on a national level. At the turn of the millennium, the Office of Research on Minority Health was elevated to National Center of Minority Health and Health Disparities. Two years later, I received pilot from UEB to establish the Minority Health Research Center. Funding which was, you know, like expanded through NIH Center of Excellent Grant. I was also drawn into the national effort as one of four people asked to assist in directing health disparities initiative at the National Center for Minority Health Disparities. In the early 2000s, UEB and NIH pushed forward, sharing a common vision and mission. As they grew, we grew. Nationally participatory based research programs were established and crucial research reports were released the UAB Center expanded to partnerships with historically black colleges and universities and invested in the new research initiatives. By the late 2000s, we achieved a key breakthrough. The National Center for Minority Health, as I mentioned, was elevated to a level of an NIH institute, giving the scope of initi to initiate and drive research 
on health disparities that never before. This coincided with the development of a global partnership between our MHERC and the town of Stoke and Trent in Staffordshire University, United Kingdom, which meant that our research center model was even successfully replicated globally. Our research was published in national peer-reviewed journals and the continued grant funding validated that our, uh, the work we pursued. The center expanded its research to Louisiana and Mississippi through focusing on the social determinants of health. And during COVID-19, we received funding from the NIH SEAL Network grant to understand the barriers to COVID testing, uh, dispel myth and misinformation, rumors, help you know get more minorities in the vaccine trials at that time before they were approved and encourage after that vaccinations. Recently, the center changed its name from just a minority, a minority health research center to minority health and health equity research center after decades of intensive research and dedicated interventions. By the late 2000, we achieved key breakthrough. I'm sorry. The journey of taking health disparities from community outreach to a validated science was not easy. We were told, as I mentioned no many times, but with resilience, those no's become, became only a small part of our 20 years legacy. There is a lesson in my journey. If you are working on something that you believe in, don't give up. Here are three things to keep in mind that they were mentioned in a publication by Freischlag and, um, and uh, Silva in a 2016 publication. Resilience is built through taking chance and risking difficulty and failure. Opposition teaches you the skill of navigating difficult situations, of making necessary adjustment and staying strong. Resilience is bolstered by building a team of people in your personal life who support you and help you face challenges. Build this team intentionally. In our mammography screening, we made a key discovery. Women whose screening were positive for cancer encountered unique challenges in making their way through the healthcare system. And that's an example that how we reached to our fourth you know, um, movement to equity. The patient navigator program, which assigns a trained lay navigator familiar with essential resources, including transportation, state-based assistance, and the process of accessing care, guided each patient through her cancer treatment. The results were astounding. Not only were we able to close a 17% gap in cancer screening between white women and African-American women, in some of the rural counties, the disparities were reversed, and African-American women were being screened at a higher rate than white women. Navigators were successful in helping patients follow up on their treatment. Though this program, we inch closer to achieving health equity. Using valuable insights from the past two decades, we have been able to apply what we know and learn about the journey to achieving health equity to our biggest project yet, Live Health Smart Alabama. As I mentioned, Alabama's health is among the worst in the nation. We're ranking 46th in obesity, 48th in diabetes, 49th in cardiovascular disease, and more. In response to a UV call for a grand challenge, we developed a plan for moving Alabama out of the bottom 10 in national health ranking by 2030, and were named the inaugural winner of the UEB grand challenge. Our daily lives are framed by the policies systems and environment that surround us. Live Health Smart Alabama is a transformational movement to make good health simple for all Americans. 
controlled by a network for more than 100 partners. I always say that if the problem in the community, the solution is in the community. Before work begins, Live Health Smart Alabama listens to the needs of its community members. We eliminate barriers of making healthy choices, such as access to healthy food options in food deserts area. Making good health simple means develop a sustainable and comprehensive plan that can be implemented in cities throughout our state. Live Health Smart Alabama has led investment for built environment improvements, including new sidewalks, bike lanes, traffic calming techniques, bus shelters, community gardens, and beautification in four Birmingham low-income neighborhoods that can be replicated all over the state. We knew that we have to change the environment of people so they can be physically active and access healthy food. Mobile grocery serving 25 insecure communities, mobile wellness van providing preventive health screenings, and community coaches navigation, commu navigating community members to appropriate healthcare facilities. So as I mentioned, the scientific we, symphony we composed together has been modeled everywhere, like even in the United Kingdom. And also in my home, my home country of Egypt. In Alexandria, we've trained medical students and junior faculty to perform research to identify populations that are at higher risk of colorectal cancer and to develop interventions those for those population. It is miraculous feeling to see the work for which we have labored so long and so passionately take hold and bear fruit all over the world. This year, we celebrated 20 years of research training and community engagement, but our work is not done. As our story is being composed, we have evolved from just a research center to an, an, a minority health and equity center. Here we have our training partnerships with HBCUs and NIH divisions. Our training teams quickly pivoted to online you know, uh, training because of COVID. And we hope that some of this technology that enriched the students' experience as some programs shift back to a person, we aim to continue expanding and nurturing the pipeline of health disparities researcher. Community engagement teams will build upon the and maintain relationships in the community. Trust is, is, is what set our work apart from other people who try to do what we do. This step is crucial in the impact we have in our community. Achieving health equity is no longer an option. It is a priority. Sometimes it can feel that success that you are hoping to achieve is so far away or that your goals are just out of your reach. But my career shows that you can start anywhere and by remaining open to the presence and contributions of other people and the universe as a whole you can ascend any height you choose. Adding to my symphony is the honor I received today. I am so grateful to be named the 2022 Velshek Gold Awardee for Humanism in Healthcare. But by far, the greatest texture has been added by the people whom I love and I have been privileged to have in my life. My brilliant husband, Fouad, while pursuing a remarkable career of his own, has afforded me limitless support and encouragement and has already been a source of inspiration. I could not ask for a better life partner. My exceptional daughters, Nancy and Mary, not only fill me with pride, but they ground me and they lift me up. My mentors and collaborators, Dr. Karina Kifa, 
Dr. Ed Partridge, and Dr. Selwyn Vickers, were symphonies unto themselves. And where we intersected, I was left infinitely richer for the interaction. Just as I owe credit and recognition to my mentors and colleagues, I owe immense, immeasurable thanks to the incredible faculty and staff with whom I have worked with over the course of my career, who have brought their timeless dimension to this work. One speech alone could be insufficient to even name them. They alone give them the, the praise that they are due. But you know who you are, and I hope you will hear my thanks as I offer it. So if you want to contact me, here are my information, and thank you. We were admonished by the AV people to remember to sit far forward on the chairs, lest we slouch into the TV uh, dilemma. So we'll do that. <laughs> um, Mona, it was a, a wonderful lecture in which you told the audience um, about the melody of your life and how uh, it happened that uh, a young woman from Cairo came to make such an impact on health disparities in uh, the southern region of the United States. It continued the theme of the day uh, that we heard about um, at the opening plenary session uh, with professors Robert George and Cornell West talking about two themes. Um, ultimately love, which uh, most people in medicine have been uncomfortable saying for a very long time, uh, and truth and the nature of it, and whether it can actually be discovered or held by any single uh, individual. And in the foundation, we've come to describe the contributions of humanism in an interesting way, that science discovers truth, and compassion speaks that truth to the heart. Yes. And, and your career and its importance in discovering the real causes of apparent inability to get care to all peoples equally uh, followed that uh, phrase dramatically and, and wonderfully uh, as a life a course. But I wonder, just to start this conversation, and we'll have this little fireside chat, and then I'd really like uh, your participation to open the conversation up further. Um, you, you started doing this and reached success uh, with extraordinary uh, persistence and passion uh, over a lifetime. And that lifetime proceeded long before uh, we we experienced the COVID pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic. And it is, in microcosm, a repetition of many of the problems that you encountered. Um, and, you know, it brought to the fore uh, the, the chaos and horror of Tuskegee, the experimentation on black citizens, and uh, all of the difficulty that perseverates because we've been afraid to tell the truth. And I wonder if you can tell us how uh, we can shorten the development. You've already done it. You've achieved it. It took you 20 years 
Um, now we have social disorder throughout the country, and uh, we are recapitulating this, this story again, and we will do it again and again. How do we bring your efforts and success to scale? That's a, that's a big question. <laughs> yeah. um, I think what, what really helped is that we developed relationships with the communities. And we, we, were, we were always there. We didn't go into the community when we had funding and we had a project and then left. We stayed. We stayed and we listened to them. As I, as I mentioned, they have answers, but we never do that. As a health providers, we feel like we're the ones who have the answers. It's our way. We tell them what to do, but we never listen to people and say, to listen to them and say what they really, their needs are, what their priorities are. So I think always building relationships and developing trust, like what happened with, with COVID-19, that there was a mistrust. Like we, we heard the community, we went and we asked them, what's, how can we get you to take a vaccine or get tested? And they said, we need to hear it from trusted voices, people that we trust. And unfortunately, with what's happening now, it's just people are not trusting us. They're not trusting what we say. So if we can just really focusing on trust and listen to the people, we'll find the solutions. And it's gonna be easy then to roll out any programs or anything that we need to do to improve their health. But we try to do it on our own without listening. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a growing and unfortunate theme, isn't it? That in, in medicine where in order to establish a relationship between a clinician and a patient, a trust is absolutely essential. And it has been eroded um, of late, especially by the events uh, of the pandemic and the politicization of what otherwise would be scientific truth. And um, many organizations and individuals have been raising the alarm that we must figure out a way to reestablish that fundamental trust for the human connection of the medical encounter uh, to be successful. And, and people are just can see through you. They know if you're real or not. You know, they can see through people when they talk to them and say they can trust you or not. So being transparent, give, you know, real factual information we think, we think that they can't understand this or their low literacy, but they understand. They understand and they can feel the truth. So being transparent, put the facts out, people are gonna get, you know, follow. Yeah. If we can change the, the conversation a little bit um, and use the wonderful theme, the metaphor of your story, the melody of science woven throughout your life and expressive in, in different ways. Um, there are many uh, works that have shown the importance, uh, the, the similarity between music and science in using many, many parts of the brain to view a tone or a problem from multiple perspectives. And, and I wonder if you think this, this is true and expressed in your life. I think it is, but also it happens um, without like your, um, without you feeling it. You have to just like when you when you listen to a music or a symphony, it takes you on. I think your life journey does the same thing, and you can feel um, what is the right decision to make, what's the next step to make, and it you know like you you can get your feelings and your passion guide you, like. Like when you listen to you know, a piece of music, your passion goes with it. Mm. So you have to have a passion for what you're doing. You know, you can't just do it just for a job. You have to have a passion for it. And you have to care and love what you do. Yeah, Cornell West this morning said that 
those who proselytize for justice but don't really believe in the problems of the people for whom they want to provide it, it's it simply falls flat falls and flat. ultimately doesn't move That's us correct. forward. Yeah. yeah. I'd love to open the conversation up to all of you. If you have uh, an observation about your own programs uh, in this area or questions for Dr. Fuad, and please take one of the microphones um, and announce who you are and uh, the organization you're with. Thanks. Uh, Quentin Eichbaum, Vanderbilt University Medical School. So I'm just curious if you can say a little bit more about the sources of the mistrust in these communities. I mean, I can understand social media feeding it and politics and all of that, but in some of the impoverished rural communities, are those similar kind of sources of mistrust? Or And the other observation, you said you put people in the community to develop that trust. I wonder if you can expand on that a little bit, because that, that's not always easy to do. So I just want to understand a little bit more about those components. So there are many reasons for mistrust. One of them is life experiences, like things that happen to community members and they lost trust. The Tuskegee, for example, was, um, um, was an example. But we, we, we wrote in a publications about not just the Tuskegee event, but the everyday Tuskegee. The everyday Tuskegee, like what a, um, a community member can face in all their, uh, their life. Like in all the, you know, like if they go to a healthcare system and they're not treated with respect, if they can't access the care, if they feel like they are treated differently, if someone is getting better care than they do because either they're poor, uninsured, or because of their race or skin color, or they have an accent, or you know, like, so that's the everyday Tuskegee that cause mistrust. The other thing that I learned, and I learned a lot from colleagues and staff, that they took me to the community and taught me how to communicate and how to present our work to the community. First they told me, trust is earned, it's not given. So you have to, you have to work to earn the trust of people. But second, perception is reality. If, if a community perceive that they're not treated fairly, there must be a reason behind that. So, um, so there are a lot of lifestyle ex life, you know, experiences that happens in people, like if we can say, um, is there um, unequal treatment for unequal people? For, for people, yes, there is an unequal treatment. Just walk into any agency or any healthcare system and see how someone can treat someone that dressed nicely in a suit and someone that is dressed in, like look like a poor person. They're gonna be treated differently. Even unconscious bias, there is a lot of unconscious bias and all of us have some bias somewhat. But um, people feel it and that's really create the mistrust. Yesterday, we, uh, we celebrated with the Organization of Student Representatives, which is the uh, AAMC's Council uh, for the Student Bodies of the nation's wonderful medical schools. And uh, for many years, the AAMC and the Gold Foundation have partnered in uh, asking for national nominations for a faculty member who is an exemplar of humanism. And uh, this year's winner was a physician named Maura George uh, from Emory, uh, works at Grady Memorial in Atlanta. And she told an anecdote, a story, about uh, a patient encounter in which her students had given out as a manifestation of sympathy or empathy perhaps, a little button that many of them were wearing on a white coat. And uh, it said crack and it had the symbol for forbidden, the circle with the line through it. And 
she noticed uh, that when patients who were addicted to cocaine came into the waiting room, uh, they saw these, these things and it wasn't uplifting. It was the opposite. Mm -hmm. And it caused mistrust because there was a disequilibrium between where the physician was and where and the, the patient, patient was in their expectations about that health encounter. And she said after she, she saw the, 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 the crestfallen face on a number of patients, they got rid uh, of those buttons. And it was an example of how difficult it is to be a good doctor. Because you have to try and resonate at oh, the frequency true. of your patient. Yeah. And it's a very, very tough yeah, that's, thing yeah. to do. You're and right. it's an extension of, yeah. the, I think, what you just yes. said. Yeah. Anyone else want to talk about the trust issue before we move on? Yes. I only have a trust question. I OK, question. fine. Uh, hi, Joelle Worm from the Medical College of Wisconsin, Kern National Network. And I work with students. And they sometimes take issue with resilience because they feel like they are constantly told to be resilient, but in systems that don't help them really feel like they can do what they want to do. So what would you say to those students? Yeah, you know, like, um, I think it's important, you know, like, I, I know maybe they're picking, they're expecting that um, the systems would accommodate them more and they don't have to push and be resilient. Unfortunately, life is not like that. You know, I wish. And um, so, but, you know, like, if you have a goal, you know, in life, and you have a goal in your career, you can't just sit there and say, the system did not help me. I think you have to try. And, and again, it's, it differs from one person to the other. Some people may not have to do that. And I think you heard a lot, it's not just me saying that. When I started, and a lot of other diverse, you know, um, in academics or maybe in other job, you know, I, I felt like I have to prove myself every day in everything. I was told when I got my first job, are you sure you can write a grant? Are you sure you can, you know, like cover your salary? I'm sure that this question was not asked to everyone that, you know, was offered the job. So for life situations, you know, like um, unfortunately our systems are not all perfect. That's the reality. So, um, you know, having some resilience to push will get you where you are, I hope. Yeah. Resilience is, is one of the, the eight elements uh, of a humanistic position that the foundation has described over the years. And it's not itself um, a goal or attainable. It's a product of uh, being able to listen deeply and uh, establish the connection that then gives you the strengths to carry on, the definition of resilience. Hi, my name is Ben, Ro can you hear me? My name is Ben Rodriguez. I work for Rich. Um, <laughs> hello, Rich. Uh, two, two questions. One is, how do you overcome the language barrier in certain underserved communities? And two, what would you say is the one or two keys, an insight into recruitment of minority candidates. Thank you. Okay, the language barrier. So I can tell you being um, a woman from Egypt with an accent, uh, this was in the early 90s. And as I mentioned, my first project was working with, uh, with the hourly workers of the city of Birmingham, and I got to work with street and sanitation workers. So it's, it's 
really, you know, like this is a group of, of workers that they, they're not in higher education. They didn't see foreigners before. Um, and here I am coming to talk to them about their blood pressure and sit with them in this cramped room. They're coming back from a hard work. But um, I think people, as I mentioned, seeing you if you care. They listen to you and then all of a sudden they forget who you are or where you came from. They needed someone and, and, I, and I think they, they did a, um, the American Heart had a, uh, a documentary with the street and sanitation workers that we worked with and they asked them what made you um, stay in this program and listen and work with Mona on this. And they said, because we found someone that cares. So I think to care would overcome your language barriers. For sure, if they have to understand, you have to speak right English, but, but being a caring person, that really can overcome a lot of, of how you speak or what's your background or if you're a woman or a man or if I'm from Birmingham, from the South or not. So just to care. Ben, there was a second part the to second your question. The second question was about getting minority in, in of, of, of patients? Minority, uh, faculty? Faculty? Yeah. yeah, that's a tough one. And, um, and, and we're still learning, you know, like we, um, we just received the first award. I know Dr. Agarwal here and uh, that then uh, a factor in helping us with putting this grant together, NIH has this first award to increase diversity in academics, and we were one of the first cycle that got that. Um, but again, this is, um, this is an effort that we need to continue to do. But one of the things that you saw, like we, our training programs um, are like we start from undergraduates and some even from high school to graduate to junior faculty. And the reasons we do that to develop the pipeline, to really develop a capacity of diverse academicians that they are, um, that they can compete, that they are, you know, that we give them all the tools to be successful. So when they apply for academic positions, they can succeed in getting that. But also we, we give them from, being young to, to really appreciate research because a lot of our minority and diverse um, physicians or scientists, they go for private work. They don't want to get into academics, but getting, you know, you need to start early with our undergraduate and graduate and get them linked to understand, you know, like, and get them to be excited about research. And if you do that, eventually you can um, recruit uh, those diverse faculty. The other thing is you have to have a good environment for them to support them and make them successful. So one of the things we're doing with the first award is not only going after, you know, like all those diverse, wonderful people out there to offer them a job. We're also, pro you know, helping our environment to support them to succeed as researchers and as faculty and also working in our institution environment to be more inclusive and um, to feel like they are in a better place and they are respected and given equal opportunities. Yeah. Please. Hi, John Luke, Dell Medical School and with the Kern National Network. First, thank you very much for your leadership and service and congratulations. I'm interested to hear your thoughts on how to socialize the spirit and the work that you've done so that we can grow this and amplify it and not think of all these opportunities as one-offs as, as a huge lift of individuals. So we can create a huge community of people like you who can really do a great service across our country. If, if I understand your question, like how we can make this, you know, more not individual, um, I think, you know, like meetings like this, but developing networks of us, you know, like we, there are opportunities for people that connect with each other that they do the same work. Um, there are organizations and meetings like this that we meet together. 
Um, but now there are a lot of, um, you know, like opportunities with the social platforms that we can develop groups and networks and learn from each other. I still learn a lot from colleagues. Um, each one of us, you know, like have um, partners and collaborators and in other institutions. But maybe we need to do a better job on really developing these networks um, to help each other. Because we can, instead of repeating our own mistakes, we can learn from each other. But, but you're right, this would be a great next step we need to do. Yeah, while healthcare is 20% of the economy uh, in the United States, it's remarkable how, how uh, insular each of the institutions and organizations uh, can be. The, the Gold Foundation's been around for almost 35 years, and I'm sure there are people in this room who never heard about the, the foundation before this morning. There was a questioner from the Kern Network, uh, which has organized uh, voluntary participation by some of the country's major medical schools in trying to pursue this group of perspectives about humanism compassion uh, and their importance in achieving optimal uh, health care. Um, but all of them are small, yeah. and medicine is very big. And the ability to brand a program as invented here, meaning at this medical center or this health system, still has extraordinary it's, it's appeal. It's very difficult. Yeah. Any other questions this morning? Yeah, the back microphone, thank you. Hi, Michelle Oster from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about your patient navigation that you established in order to help build that trust and navigation to yeah. increase the number of women um, to get screened. Okay, thank you. Um, so when we first started and we saw that there are a lot of, uh, especially in breast cancer and now we're, we're uh, scaling this up to other conditions, um, that there are a lot of um, residents or at the time it was women in rural Alabama and inner city that they were really scared about getting a mammogram. They had this fatalistic approach that they're never gonna be cured, that it's a stigma, that you know, like they, they were really, they had all this myth about um, what a screening could do. We felt like we need to find people like them to, to encourage them and navigate them because it's so hard for us sitting in our offices to reach out there. And also develop that community capacity like from the assets of the community. And so I, again, I'm coming from a developing countries and a lot of developing countries, they have those natural helpers and even here in, in our communities, those people that they help their neighbors, they, they cook them, you know, bring them soup, you know, like yeah. if they're sick, or take care of their kids if they have to go to a place, or, um, or driving to a um, to place if they don't have um, a transportation. So we built on that natural helpers um, model, and we trained the, those community members to promote breast cancer screening, like after that, to help navigate women to get um, treatment. And after that, we also worked with navigators to educate African-American patients to get in cancer therapeutic trials. But building this capacity and how you find them, you know, like we went to the community like um, um, trusted people in the community and leaders, like uh, a pastor or some leader and say, who are your natural helpers in your community? And they would, would they tell us, Miss so-and-so or Mr. so-and-so, and we go and talk to her, and it's like a domino effect, everyone bring the other. And eventually you have a group, and then you talk to them and give them facts. We give them numbers, we show them and said, there are more white women get breast cancer, but there's more African-American women dying from it. What do you wanna do about it? And we trained them and it was amazing what they did. They just used their own 
uh, methodology. You know, like we gave them talking points, but they did it themselves with their own way of reaching other women. So, uh, and they're very empowered. Some of them even didn't want to be employed by us because they said, I want to get credibility in my community. So um, we've been doing this now for almost 20 years. It's evolved and we're using now this model for a lot of other uh, conditions. Great opportunity. Um, I'm going to ask uh, our colleague, Julia Lowe, to come back to the podium and close out this wonderful session that was uh, triggered and elevated by uh, Dr. Fuad. And I'm sure she will be here for a few minutes after we uh, adjourn, so that if you have other questions or comments, she will be here to take them. And again, thank you, Rich, and thanks to the Gold Foundation and the Velcher Foundation. I'm really, really honored today. Thank you. Great honor. What a phenomenal, phenomenal discussion. Thank you both, and to Dr. Fuad, we are extremely grateful for your contributions and for your lifelong commitment and dedication to equity. We have one more announcement to make before you go. At the Vilcic Foundation, every year we award prizes to immigrants, artists and scientists who are living, working, and contributing to the U.S. Today, we are excited to announce that the call for nominations for the 2023 Vilcha Gold Award for Humanism and Healthcare opens. We invite all of you to nominate a foreign born healthcare professional who, like Dr. Fuad, has made a national impact in this country. You can learn more about eligibility requirements and more on the Gold or Vilcha Foundation's websites. Nominations will be accepted starting today through January 31st. We also would like to ask for your help. Please help us spread the word, share this opportunity with your networks, and help us continue spotlighting immigrant leaders that are championing humanism in healthcare every day. So that is it. Thank you all again for joining us, and congratulations once again to Dr. Mona Fuad.